Hello friends. East Coast Pete here. This is Mid Rock Crisis. Definitely aptly named show, if I do say so myself, for this particular presentation. Um, I happen to be one of those people who for some odd reason can't force myself to listen to Pink Floyd unless Roger Waters is around. He's there, I'm fine. If he's not, I'm not. That's just how I am. But I'll bet you there's people out there that could say the same about Sid Barrett. And when he left, it just wasn't the same. I found out some interesting facts about Sid. I think you'll be interested. He was born Roger Keith Barrett, 1946, and he died in 2006. Lead singer and primary writer for Pink Floyd's first version. Guitarist and frontman from 65 till 68, when he was ousted from the band he created. Sid was musically active for about 10 years. After a short, unsuccessful solo career, he retired from music and seemed to disappear. Mental illness may have played a part in his behavior, but his family denies this. From Cambridge, England, Roger was the fourth of five children in a middle-class family. His father was a prominent pathologist who died when Roger was 16. He attended Cambridgeshire High School where he first met Roger Waters. After his father died, Barrett was devastated. His mom encouraged him to play in a band that would practice at their house. The band was called Jeff Mott and the Mottos. Roger Waters were not in that band, but he attended gigs, mostly at parties and picnics. Barrett named himself Sid after a jazz bassist named Sid the Beat Barrett, but there's no relation. He used his nickname everywhere except at home. Barrett met David Gilmore at Cambridge Technical College. Barrett and his mates were initially Beatle and Rolling Stones fans, like so many. Barrett played bass with those without during the summer of 63. He played with several bands through 64, including the Holler and Blues, the Screaming Abdabs, Sigma Six, the Megadeths, T-Set, and finally the Pink Floyd Sound, aka the Pink Floyd Blues Band. This band consisted of Richard Wright on piano, Nick Mason on drums, and Roger Waters on bass, and Sid on guitar and lead vocals. Barrett had been writing stories since age 10 when he was a Boy Scout and a patrol leader. He began to write song lyrics for his bands, but they primarily played cover songs and blues. By 66, the band had developed their own style of improvised rock and roll to augment their sets. The band became a more psychedelic freeform band with the use of LSD, which had hit the swing in London scene like a squall. Nick Mason credited Barrett for the direction the band took, and his song lyrics reflected his interest in Grimm's fairy tales, Tolkien, Carlos Castaneda, and the I Ching. Around this time, a new music venue opened in London named UFO, pronounced UFO. Pink Floyd became the house band on the strength of their long improvised jams. They soon became the most popular band in the London underground scene. The band was managed by Andrew King and Pete Jenner, who arranged for their first demos to be recorded, and Joe Boyd, proprietor at the UFO Club, 
recorded a 16-minute Space Jam called Interstellar Overdrive. The track was used in the avant-garde film Tonight, Let's All Make Love in London. Go watch that, yeah. After a short bidding war with Polyphone, Pink Floyd signed with EMI. The band was given unlimited studio time, and the result was their first album, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and the single Arnold Lane. It was explained that Arnold Lane was banned by the BBC for lewd lyrics, but that's not true. It was banned by a pirate radio station for being too far removed from normal society. The song rose to number 20 on the UK charts before slipping back down. It was backed by the single Candy and a Current Bun, which was first named Let's Roll Another One. David Bowie once commented that when he first heard Sid do Arnold Lane, he decided to become a singer because the lyrics, Arnold Lane had a strange hobby, collecting clothes, moonshine washing line, is purportedly about a transvestite who stole women's undergarments from a clothesline and said, sang it with his English accent. It's a thing that no Brit pop star did. They wanted to sound like Americans. But because Sid sang with his British accent, David Bowie said, I'm going to do that too. Roger Waters claimed it was based on a true story. When the song was played in Floyd's, said it lasted 10 to 15 minutes, but it was pared down to three minutes for radio play. And Sid didn't like the three minute version. This didn't stop EMI from promoting it, as well as the band's second single, See Emily Play. Emily was also a real person, a young girl who dropped LSD at a free concert where Floyd played called The Games of May. Emily was a member of royalty, the daughter of a baron. Sid was embarrassed to play Emily on top of the pops. And Roger Waters said that it was this time that Sid's personality began to change. The album Piper at the Gates of Dawn was recorded at Abbey Road in 1967. Two tracks became a part of Floyd's set, Interstellar Overdrive and Astronomy Domini. You think it's Astronomy Domain? Other people do too. The other songs were only played live a few times. These were Lucifer Sam, Matilda Mother, Flaming, Power Talk H, The Gnome, Chapter 24, The Scarecrow, and slightly better known, Bike. The U.S. release included C. Emily Play and Candy and a Current Bun, Apples and Oranges, Paint Box and Arnold Lane in a box set. When Parp Piper was released, Barrett was no longer acting the part of the friendly, intelligent, and charismatic frontman. He became gradually more erratic, and this seemed to coincide with his use of hallucinogens. Did drugs drive him mad? That's not clear. Schizophrenia was mentioned. Depression and Asperger's syndrome was also considered. The reality was that Sid preferred the anonymous times, having fun with his bandmates, gigging without specific songs, no pressure. That all changed after the release of the singles and the album, and Sid was expected to support the two singles. Instead, he became withdrawn and uncommunicative. He experienced memory lapses and occasional catatonia. He didn't recognize his friends and adopted a 
His guitar playing at gigs was highly experimental, sometimes consisting of one chord for the whole gig, and sometimes he just stood still and played nothing. Fans went along with this behavior as an artistic statement. The band was nonplussed but continued. David O'List of The Nice was brought in on guitar, and David Gilmore also filled in when Sid was a no-show. And there's no doubt that it was Gilmore's guitar that catapulted Pink Floyd to elite superstardom. One day, on the way to a gig, the band simply left Sid home. They had decided to keep him in the band, but not on the road. Similar to what the Beach Boys had done with Brian Wilson. Sid's songwriting had also declined and Jug Band Blues was the last song he wrote for Pink Floyd. In the next few years, Pink Floyd went on to become one of the most heralded and successful rock bands in history. Sid Barrett re-entered the music world briefly as a solo artist from 68 to 72, and he recorded his singles Terrapin, Octopus, and Bob Dylan's Blues. He released an album, The Madcap Laughs, with the help of drummers from Humble Pie and Joker's Wild. Members of Soft Machine added overdubs in the studio. The album had little to no pr promotion and Sid did not like to tour. A second eponymous album, Sid Barrett, was put together with Richard Wright and Dave Gilmore. Dave had become a full-time member of Pink Floyd by then. These two albums have value mostly to completists. In 1972, Barrett signed a document removing himself from Pink Floyd's future activities. He resigned from the music business. The Sex Pistols and The Damned asked him to produce their albums, but Sid refused. In 78, when his money ran out, he moved back to Cambridge. He actually walked the 60 miles between London and Cambridge. He moved into a room next to his mom's house. He stayed away from paparazzi. He pursued painting and gardening. And he valued his privacy. But rumors about his mental state swirled. He did turn up to collect his royalties, which Pink Floyd made sure that he received. He had shaved his head, put on weight, and shaved his eyebrows in an effort to avoid recognition. Floyd included Jug Band Blues on their album Metal, though it was out of place with the other tracks. Piper, Saucer Full of Secrets, and Metal were the only Floyd studio albums to include any of Sid's work. Floyd's song, Shine On You Crazy Diamond, was about Sid, and the album, The Wall, was loosely and partially based on Sid. Barrett's health declined. He had stomach ulcers and type 2 diabetes. He continued to be bothered by paparazzi when out walking or cycling in the neighborhood. He died at age 60, leaving 1.7 million pounds to his siblings. A tribute concert was organized and played by Robin Hitchcock in 2007 called The Madcap's Last Laugh. Chrissy Hind also played. A memorial bench with Sid's name was placed in the Botanical Gardens in London. And the abstract paintings that he did were given a showing and circulated by art collectors. It was said that Sid's spirit haunted all of Pink Floyd's albums. I get that. Pink Floyd's lyrics were mostly written by Roger Waters until they harshly split up after the wall and the final cut. Waters was not a happy camper either. He disparaged the music business by, for destroying Sid, among other reasons, and other sins, but this may have also been guilt 
mixed with a common dislike of the trappings of fame. When Roger left, Gilmore, Wright, and Mason continued to tour and record, but without Waters and Barrett. Pink Floyd were only a shadow of what they were and of what they could be. Waters pursued a solo career, produced and presented an elaborate rendition of The Wall, and released records in his own name. He was not able to commandeer the Pink Floyd name, as the Dave, Nick, and Richard continued to tour and record as Pink Floyd. When they provided mixes for their first Roger Free recordings, an exec at the label exclaimed, These sound nothing like Pink Floyd songs. Sid Barrett, Roger Waters, Richard Wright, Nick Mason, and David Gilmore. Five great musicians. Maybe the very best. But their story was no joyride. If you look at some of these tapes of Sid Barrett early on, you sense a certain innocent intelligence and clever attitude of the spirit of the 60s that may not have been able to survive the 70s or beyond anyway. He's a product of the 60s. He produced the 60s. <laughs> He's a good guy. He liked his friends, he liked his band, he liked his music, he liked to play guitar, he liked to freak people out, he liked the light shows, he liked the women, he liked to write funny poems. Between Sid Barrett and Mark Boland, perhaps the glam scene would have lasted more than, what, half a decade? I don't think Sid would be like to know him as a glam artist, but you never know. Thanks for being with me. I'm East Coast Pete. Please subscribe and hit like. I'll be back as soon as I can.